very much, Donald, and thanks to all of you for being here. It's uh, an honor and a pleasure to be here with you. I'm also glad to have my son James uh, here with me. Uh, uh, James is a senior at Brigham Young University studying political science. The man has an interest in the law, and I'm grateful for that. <laughs> I uh, w was raised in a home where we discussed the law, the Constitution, and issues related to government around the dinner table. It was uh, a home in which uh, that's just what we did. I didn't realize it was unusual until I was about 30, but I'd appreciate it nonetheless. <laughs> I ran an unusual campaign for the United States Senate when I first ran for office in 2010. This was the first time I had run for any public office. Uh, I, I had been practicing law up until that point. I ran an unusual campaign, one focused on restoring constitutionally limited government, on restoring certain founding era principles of liberty uh, that we hold dear in the United States and that many of you share in Great Britain. I was elected for the first time at age 39 to the United States Senate. And when I arrived, that made me the youngest member of the Senate. Uh, uh, 39 is practically a baby in Senate <laughs> years. Um, it, it, and in fact, I felt as if I didn't fit in. Uh, so much so that um, I, I felt the need to tell people, yes, I'm only 39 years old, but I read at the level of a 40-year-old. <laughs> <laughs> they weren't that impressed. That didn't work that well. <laughs> to make matters worse, the security personnel at the Capitol, every time I would approach the Senate chamber to cast my votes, would ask for my identification. And usually they would point to the other door as if to say the door for the staff is over there. I would have to produce identification for them. They did not want to see my driver's license. Uh, I'll show you what I, what I had to give them. This is, uh, this is my Senate identification card. It has my name on it. It says uh, I'm a United States Senator representing Utah. Uh, the, the original version of it, before I was re-elected, said expiration January 3rd, 2017. <laughs> that was a particular concern to my wife and our three children. <laughs> to be assured, that was not the date when I would personally expire as a human being, <laughs> rather my term of office. Each time we went through this exercise, it grew more tiring, until I mentioned it to a colleague one day. I said, I keep being asked for my identification. Well, why does this happen? Or are they ever going to remember me? And that's when uh, this colleague said to me, uh, you need to wear your pin. What pin? Well, there's a lapel pin they gave you and when you were sworn into office. I said, yeah, I remember that well. I don't wear such things. I put it to my desk drawer, closed the drawer, and forgot all about it. And he said, that pin is worn only by U.S. Senators. If you will wear it, they will recognize you. They will let you into the Senate chamber. So sure enough, I put it on. And it worked like a charm. It's been my constant companion ever since then. I've become so fond of it, I've come to naming it. I, I call it my sorry senator pin. Because when they ask for my identification, I point to the pin and they say, sorry, senator. <laughs> it worked flawlessly ever since then, or nearly so. After I'd been there for nearly a year, I, I was there one, one day with uh, 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 casting a vote. I had one arm gently resting on the desk in front of me when an unarmed security officer came up, uh, a non-uniformed armed officer came up and, and said to me, uh, will you please not lean on the senator's desk in a very harsh tone of voice? And I <coughs> felt bad about this. I apologize. I'm sorry, it won't happen again. You see, I've got to explain something about the desks. The desks in the Senate are original equipment, which means they date back to about 1860 when the wing of the U.S. Capitol currently occupied by the Senate was completed, which means that some of these desks are nearly as old as some of my colleagues in the Senate. <laughs> <laughs> They're understandably protective of them. I said, I'm sorry, sir, it won't happen again. He proceeded to question me. Are you with the minority? Referring to the minority party, the Republican Party at the time. Well, what do you mean? On this vote or the next? I don't always vote for, with my party. Sometimes they get it wrong. Or are you with the minority leader? And I said, I still don't know what you mean. Mitch McConnell is our leader. Why are you asking this? And he said, are you part of the minority leader's staff? And then I realized, oh, he doesn't know who I am. So I pointed to the sorry Senator Penn. It got me only a blank stare. And so then I did something I didn't want to have to do, I don't like to do, certainly didn't like doing it. Then I had to use my title. And because I didn't want to do it, I mumbled it. I, I said, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm Senator Lee. 
What? Uh, I said, okay, my name is Mike Lee. I represent a state called Utah. It's sort of square. It resembles a chair. It's in the Rocky Mountains. And we have lovely skiing. <laughs> Only then did he realize who I was and what his mistake had been. And he said to me in one hurried breath as all the colors seemed to drain from his face, I'm terribly sorry for the misunderstanding, sir. My name is Steve, if you want to report me. And then he ran for the door. Oh. <laughs> it was an honest mistake. I felt bad for Steve, so I chased after him. But Steve was too fast. <laughs> so from then on, every time I saw Steve, I stopped and I shook his hand. I said, hi, Steve. And I'd engage in, in uh, uh, chatter with Steve for a few minutes just so he knew there were no hard feelings. And I carried that on for several years until Steve retired. And only recently did it occur to me, his name probably isn't Steve. <laughs> <laughs> For all I know, it's Bob. Steve's a guy he works with who he doesn't like. <laughs> I had to assert my right to be there that day. Had I not done so, because it was awkward for me to do so, I might have been deprived of the opportunity to vote that day. Had that happened, I would have lost something. Those I represent would have lost something. Every one of us has something to lose. We have a lot to lose, especially when we fail to assert our rights, especially when we forget what freedom looks like and when we fail properly to assert it. It's my hope that by talking about a couple of my heroes tonight, including Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan, that we can help more fully to restore those rights. My son James and I were talking recently about the fact that here in the United Kingdom, you seem to have a different word for everything, or at least for many things, but the concepts remain the same. What you call Mr. Whippy, we call soft serve. Apparently Margaret Thatcher had something to do with the invention of Mr. Whippy. What, what you call football, we call soccer. What you call lorries, we call trucks. And what you call Margaret Thatcher, we call Ronald Reagan. <laughs> or very nearly so. In many respects, they came out of a similar mode. They came out of a similar line of thought. A line of thought that said conservatism need not be, and in fact ought not be, ever, about stodgy thinking, about lofty individuals, about those individuals who care not to interact with the masses. In fact, Conservative thought, properly understood, is itself populist at its core. Conservative thought is itself that which can help elevate people out of a state of poverty. You see something Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan understood, something that they held in common, was the belief that what lifts people out of poverty is not so much access to a government program as it is access to each other. Throughout history, Throughout all of time, the wealthy had access to markets. Capitalism didn't invent free markets. Conservatism didn't invent free markets. Markets exist in and of themselves. It's just that throughout much of our history, those who had access to markets were those with means. And everyone else was excluded or beholden to the few who had privileged access to markets. What we need is access to each other. What people need are access to free markets and access to robust institutions of civil society. These twin pillars of our robust, thriving economy have done more to elevate more people out of poverty, more to build a stronger, bigger, fuller middle class than any government program ever has, ever could, or ever will. And so it was with this in mind that Margaret Thatcher came onto the scene at a time when, as I understand it, the Conservative Party was not at its strongest. At a time when the Conservative Party here in the UK was not exactly thought of as the friend of the common man and the common woman. Uh, and so Margaret Thatcher came onto the scene and said, let's look at things a little bit differently. Let's give people access to markets, access to each other, access to ownership. She created an ownership society one that acknowledged that people will do much better when they can have access to things that they can own. And so while she introduced this concept uh, that people could acquire homes and own them, homes that once belonged to the government and 
uh, did so under programs that once prohibited them from even making modest improvements to the homes in which they resided. She gave them the ability to ultimately acquire those homes, not just make improvements to them. And it became so popular that the program itself was completely co-opted. It was adopted in full, as I understand it, by the Labor Party. This was an, an innovation. This was remarkable. So too with Ronald Reagan. When he came onto the scene, the Republican Party had seen a series of defeats. At the end of 1976, Ronald Reagan had challenged an incumbent Republican Party uh, uh, candidate, the, the incumbent Republican President of the United States, Gerald Ford. He had done so from a position of populist conservatism. At this moment, at the end of 1976, when Ronald Reagan had earlier that year lost the primary, and later in that year, seeing his party go down in defeat to Jimmy Carter in the presidential race, and seeing uh, the Republican Party's position in Congress grow even weaker, he was discouraged. And so were movement conservatives throughout the United States. It would have been easy for him to walk away in despair and say, this can't be done. But he emerged years later, armed with an agenda. An agenda built on many years, decades in fact, of inter interacting with common everyday Americans. Uh, uh, the, the forgotten man and the forgotten woman uh, whom the uh, political establishments of both political parties had left behind, whose own pain had been caused and in fact exacerbated by the very government programs that were supposed to alleviate them. And he emerged with an agenda one based ultimately on restoring these twin pillars of robust economic growth and upward economic opportunity brought about through access to free markets and robust institutions of civil society. This time it worked. And he stuck to those principles. Mike, like Margaret Thatcher, who was doing similar things across the pond, Ronald Reagan stuck to the same, same principles and he gave the same message over and over and over again until it hurt, until it worked. And it did, in fact, work. And what we saw was economic growth on both sides of the Atlantic, economic growth that worked. We have, in both of our countries, a certain, certain shared aptitude uh, for a, a number of things that we hold dear, a, a shared affinity for certain virtues, including representative government, including the rule of law, including the fact that we've realized through sad experience that when you give too few people access to too much power, bad things happen. <clears throat> In fact, we are the inheritors and the beneficiaries of political philosophies developed right here in the United Kingdom that acknowledge this very fact that acknowledge the fact that human beings, while redeemable, are flawed. And because they are flawed, we can't give any one person too much power, because they will start to take advantage of other human beings when that happens. James Madison explained it this way in Federalist No. 51. Uh, the Federalist Papers, of course, were a series of essays published under the pseudonym of Pope Publius in order to persuade the states to ratify the recently written Constitution. Madison explained these principles of human nature that were themselves inspired, among others, by the uh, philosophies of John Locke, when he explained that if human beings were angels, we wouldn't have need of government because we would treat each other kindly, consistently, and without avarice, without malice. We wouldn't have any need of government at all. But we're not angels, and because we're not angels, we need government, we need laws to keep us in check, we need access to force to deal with those who behave in an unseemly fashion. Unfortunately, we don't have access to angels to govern over us either, because we're not angels, and we don't have access to angels to govern over us. We have to have rules. And that list of rules is embodied in our case, in a single written document, which we've amended a total of 27 times, but one that has stood the test of time. They were drafted in its original form uh, in 1787 in the city of Philadelphia, 
It has proven sufficiently flexible, sufficiently universal in its approach in acknowledging the weaknesses of human beings uh, to help foster the development of the greatest civilization the world has ever known. As it has done that, I think it's benefited both countries. I think both countries have led each other in positive <coughs> directions over the centuries since then. Because of the fact that we've limited power, we've shown other countries that it works. Other countries have followed, and it's sometimes given us good examples uh, to watch out for. Central to our success in the United States has been a couple of features in our Constitution that have for too long been neglected, have been overlooked, have been forgotten, in effect, have been written out of our books. Among those are federalism and separation of powers. Although those are somewhat unique to the American system, in some ways they have parallels in the United Kingdom. Federalism is, of course, the vertical separation of powers, the process by which we've identified certain powers that must be exercised at the federal level, but uh, acknowledge at the same time that all other powers uh, are, are to be exercised at the same state and the local level. I understand that the same feature doesn't exist as a formal mal uh, uh, as a formal matter in the United Kingdom, even though there are a number of things that are by their nature local. Uh, there isn't the same presumption that exists in our Constitution uh, written into the main body of the Constitution and supplemented by the Tenth Amendment, making clear that as a default proposition, all power is local unless it's made national. The other <coughs> protection is horizontal. We refer to this as separation of powers. Uh, the fact that we have one branch that makes the law, that's Congress. Uh, we have another branch headed by the president, the executive branch, that enforces the laws. And a third branch, the, the judicial branch, headed by the U.S. Supreme Court, that interprets the laws where people disagree as to the meaning of a particular law. Sadly, tragically in my opinion, we've drifted from both of these protections over the last 80 years. And we have done so to our own detriment. If you look at the first 150 years or so of our republic, we followed both of those models quite carefully, quite closely, in part because we had seen the dangers associated with the excessive accumulation of power in the hands of the few. Some in America like to suggest that the American Revolution was all about rejecting the idea of a monarchy. Uh, I acknowledge that might have had something to do with it, but as much as anything else, it had to do with the fact that we had uh, we were subject at the time to a large, distant national government with a legislative body that knew no limits around its power, that had no requirement that it uh, refrain from legislating in all cases whatsoever. And as a result of that, we decided to separate and create our own government. No sooner had we uh, separated than we created a government that reflexively gave too little power under the Articles of Confederation shortly after the American Revolution came to its conclusion uh, to the federal government. It was an inept government under the Articles of Confederation, uh, uh, and we emerged from the Constitutional Convention with a more perfect form of government, one that appropriately made some things federal and everything else local, everything else to be handled at a state and local level. Over the last 80 years, there has been an accumulation of power in Washington that has neglected both federalism and separation of powers. In other words, power has been removed from the American people in two steps. In the first step, power has been taken away from the people at the state and local level and moved to Washington, D.C. in violation of federalism. In the second step, Within Washington, D.C., it's been voluntarily relinquished, transferred, abandoned, delegated by the people's <coughs> elected lawmakers, whose sole job it is to make law, and handed it over to unelected, unaccountable bureaucrats. Now, I want to make very clear one thing. The, the unelected, unaccountable bureaucrats in the executive branch to whom I refer are, are well-intentioned people. They're hard-working people. Most of them are very well-educated. A lot of them are highly specialized. They have a lot of expertise. 
I bear them no ill will simply because they hold that job or they do that job. No, it's not about them. It's about the members of Congress who over the last 80 years, under every conceivable partisan combination, I mean houses of representatives, senates, and presidents, of every conceivable partisan combination, have voluntarily delegated away that which is non-delegable, that which John Locke and Charles de Montesquieu uh, acknowledged could not, should never be delegated away, the lawmaking power. This is exactly why in our Constitution, our Article 1, uh, Section 1, Clause 1, the very first operative provision of the U.S. Constitution says, all legislative powers herein granted shall be vested in a Congress which shall consist of a Senate and a House of Representatives. Article 1, Section 7 goes on to say that in order to make a federal law, a law that has national application in the U.S. system, it requires a couple of things. Bicameral passage, passage by both the House and the Senate, and presentment to the President, followed by either signature or acquiescence by the President, or veto by the President, followed by a uh, possible two-thirds uh, override in both Houses of Congress. Either way, that's the formula prescribed for making federal law. But starting about 80 years ago, Congress became addicted to this two-step power transfer. First, of rendering federal, national, that which was not made federal or national by the Constitution, and then again, distorting the constitutional system by transferring the power. Let me explain how that works, often with the best of intentions. Take any problem of potentially national significance or any problem that people are worried about. Maybe even in some cases it's a problem that, uh, uh, that might have a, a, a lot of natural, national application. Or, or, or constitutional legitimacy as a, as a federal matter. Let's say clean air, for example. In many cases, it's appropriate for Congress to legislate with regard to clean air because you have an interstate transfer of pollution. Pollution might be generated, say, for instance, at a power plant in one state, and then uh, that, that pollution will transfer to other states. Our constitutional system is broad enough to encompass that by giving Congress the power to regulate commerce, or one might say interstate uh, and international trade or commercial uh, transactions. This, in effect, amounts to an interstate commercial transaction. So uh, uh, in many instances, that is just fine for Congress to legislate. But sometimes Congress chooses not to legislate, but to delegate it to somebody else. So it'll pass a law saying, for instance, we shall have clean air. What buffoon would vote against that? I mean, you might as well vote uh, against a resolution saying that uh, puppies are cute and cuddly. Nobody's going to vote against that. So we shall have clean air. And then comes the fine print. And we hereby delegate to the Environmental Protection Agency the power to make and enforce rules. Rules that carry the force of generally applicable federal law. And by the way, those same people at the EPA who will make those laws will also be enforcing those laws. All questions surrounding this area of the law, from what amounts to pollution, to what acceptable levels of pollution might be, to what fines will accompany excessive pollution under those same laws, which those same people will be enforcing, will be made by the enforcers at the EPA. What's the problem with this? Well, in the first case, it deviates dangerously from the constitutional delegation of power to Congress itself. Secondly, and for very related reasons, it is problematic from the standpoint that it insulates the end user, if you will, uh, the ultimate consumer, the ultimate, uh, 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 the, those people ultimately affected by the law, namely the American people, from the political process itself, from the process by which they have the ability to influence what the law is and what the law says. So for instance, let's suppose that the EPA sets some unreasonable rules. Let's say for instance that it sets ozone limits, which in some cases are below where Mother Nature herself has set ozone limits, at, at, at levels below the naturally occurring ambient ozone levels. 
This is a true fact. This is not hypothetical. This has actually happened. In those circumstances, it can wreak havoc on a local economy when the EPA reaches that conclusion as to a particular area. And people will write letters uh, to their senators and their congressmen, understandably saying, hey, we've got a problem. Resulting in senators and congressmen beating their chest and saying, do you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to write a strongly worded letter to the EPA, as if that were our job, to write strongly worded letters to those who make the law. Last time I checked, we are those who make the law, and we are responsible for it. So it is of no coincidence, in my opinion, that at the same time we've been delegating this power, we've also been accumulating power in Washington, power that isn't always ours. So I mentioned clean air. That's one where there often is. I, I would even accept normally, uh, presumptively, is appropriate for federal legislation. In some cases, it's not <coughs> nearly that clear. In some cases, what's being regulated through one of these so-called alphabet soup federal agencies is not, in fact, interstate, is not, in fact, attached to any distinct federal power. Laws governing purely local activities like labor, manufacturing, agriculture, mining uh, have become federal over the years, and in part because so many things have become the business of the federal government. Members of Congress don't want to have to deal with all those, partly because they don't want the accountability of coming up with difficult line-drawing decisions that will often be controversial, and sometimes because they can't keep up with the sheer amount of work involved in that, and so they resort to delegating once again. <coughs> For several decades, members of Congress saw that some of this might be a problem. They kept one foot in the door. They did so through uh, provisions that we refer to as uh, legislative veto features of legislation. There were hundreds of these passed uh, between the 1930s when we first start, started doing this sort of thing and the 1980s when uh, in the mid-1980s, the Supreme Court decided a case called INS v. Chata, in which the Supreme Court de declared those legislative veto provisions unconstitutional. Many people believed, understandably, that Congress would stop delegating away its power at that point when the Supreme Court said that this was in violation of Article I, Section 7 that I referenced earlier. But no, it didn't get better. If anything, it got worse. The Congress, you see, had become so addicted to the elixir of unconstitutional delegation of legislative power, which thus far the Supreme Court has almost never been willing to enforce, that Congress couldn't stop doing it. It made it easier for members of Congress to do that which is the holy grail, which is the achievement of perpetual re-election, because you avoid criticism in the process. The problem with all of this is that it leads to the excessive accumulation of power and money and influence in the hands of the few, which is the very danger we sought to push back against at the time of our founding, which is the very danger that helps diminish an upwardly mobile economy, one in which a person can have the reasonable hope and expectation that after having been born into poverty, he or she one day can retire comfortably after working hard, playing by the rules, and doing their best to earn a living. Nowhere is this made more clear than in some of the economic patterns that we can see from the last few years. Consider this fact, for example. Currently, six of the wealthiest counties in the United States, six of the ten wealthiest counties in the entire country of the United States of America, are suburbs of Washington, D.C. Now, this is an area that is lovely, to be sure. I encourage you to come by sometime. It's a great place. Lovely monuments, scenery. But it manufactures nothing. It mines nothing. There are no gold mines there, or platinum mines, or silver mines. It is not a manufacturing hub. It is not a technological innovation hub. It is not a banking hub. No, the money is there only because the power is there, concentrated <coughs> in the hands of a few elites. This is dangerous. This is destructive. And so this is our moment to bring populism and conservatism back together once again. This is the moment where Margaret Thatcher's conservatism and Ronald Reagan's conservatism 
must merge and unite once again to send this message loudly and clearly. Big government has had a nice long run, and it's been very good for a few elites who have grown wealthy and prosperous as a result of it. But it must end. Because we're the good of the people. We're the good of upward mobility itself. For the good of those same institutions that have fostered the development of the greatest civilization the world has ever known, that have brought more people out of poverty than any government program ever has, ever could, or ever will, we've got to start making these changes. It's a simple equation. We can see where this works. Before I leave you, I want to explain that this is more than an academic problem. When I first started following this issue 20 years ago, I learned at the time that the costs of excessive federal regulations are significant and far from academic. These things disproportionately affect America's poor and middle class. At the time, I learned that federal regulations and compliance with them cost the American economy $300 billion a year, and that these costs are borne dis disproportionately by America's poor and middle class, who pay for those things through higher prices on goods, higher prices on services, diminished wages, unemployment, and underemployment. And so it had the effect, it was explained to me, of a, a, a backdoor invisible and highly regressive tax, albeit a tax that was, in fact, invisible, because unlike your actual tax bill, you can't see it on a receipt. You don't file returns at the end of the year where you see exactly how much it's costing you. People, some people in America will have others believe that federal regulatory compliance is a cost born overwhelmingly, if not entirely, by big corporate fat cats. Picture a Monopoly game piece, or somebody dressed like Mr. Peanut, complete with double-breasted suit and monocle. This is not so. It's borne by those least capable of bearing it. But you want to know the scary thing? The scary thing is that price tag has not diminished in the 20 years since I first started following this. No, it's gotten much worse. It's increased roughly sevenfold to around $2 trillion a year. So even though America has continued to see a degree of economic growth, it has been slower in the past, and it has inured less to the growing, thriving, or previously so, middle class. We've seen a lot of concern with the excessive accumulation of power and money and influence in the hands of the few. We have to bring this back home. We have to return to first principles. Fortunately, we have in Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher a shining beacon of hope, of liberty, of those same principles attached to the rule of law, to individual liberty, and representative government that have fostered the development of two great civilizations straddling the Atlantic Ocean. We can restore these things. It's going to be difficult, but in order to restore them, we have to acknowledge them and we have to assert them, even when, especially when, it's difficult. We can do this. We can. We must. And together we will. Thank you very much.